Uh, shalom, shalom, you all. Hesed v'shalom, and Ron Smith here, and we are looking into the last two portions of Leviticus this week. Yes. I'm recording this on the 17th day of May, 2017, and we are about to look at the last portion of Leviticus for the next two days. I decided to go ahead and split it up into uh, two sessions. And this portion is called Behukotai. So, uh, before we get into this portion, these last two chapters of Leviticus, let's pray. Avinu Shabashamayim, our Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for this time to be with you again, again, yet again. We thank you so much for the, uh, the relevance of your eternal word. And we thank you so much for the men and women who have sacrificed so much, including their lives, to bring this word to us in various translations. And even though we love the translations, we love your original text all the more. And we don't want to discredit either one. So today, we ask as usual that, we, that your Holy Spirit, your Spirit who authored the book, would sink it into our hearts, and into our lives, into our minds, that we may be transformed and that we may follow your will, to know your will and thus follow it. Thank you, Father, for all that you give, all that you provide, even, even today. And thank you for your guidance. Hashem Yeshua, in Jesus' name, Amen. Well, my friends, we come to Leviticus chapter 26, verse 3. And before this week is over with, we will conclude with what we call Leviticus. Called the I'm going to go ahead and well, let's introduce this. It's called Behokotai. Behokotai means by my laws. It's one of three divisions of Torah. Torah is made up of the Edut, the uh, the witness, uh, the, uh, well, really the Edut, the, it would be better said as the Mitzvot. We usually categorize them in another way, but basically the Mitzvot, the Mishpatim, the Mishpatim and the the hukim or the hukot that can go either feminine or masculine but I've said many times the mitzvot, the commands that is, are the only things commanded. Now the laws are commanded but they are already they're established as laws. The statutes, the mishpatim, the, uh, the court cases are set before us. They're not commanded. And what is it about a law that makes a command, but then again not. Well, the word hok comes from a word that means it's something that is a, a long custom. In fact, custom is a synonym of the word law, as well as statute or decree. All of these are synonyms. So a custom stands for a long time, and just because it becomes tradition, tradition is another nice little synonym, then that tradition becomes law. And that's with a lot of the the, the hukim of the Torah, some of them actually pre, predate the establishment of the nation of Israel. And many of them actually, however, flow directly from the Lord. And there are things that are old traditions that go back to Genesis that the Lord does not choose to make part of his nation. So he, he is the final authority on what is a law. I thought I'd take a moment there. A hukah is a constitution. A constitution is a form of law. We talk in America about the rule of law. When we usually say that, often we're saying, talking about the rule of law within a conversation about the constitution. And Torah, where Torah means teaching, it is written as a constitution, particularly in the book that we call Deuteronomy. Okay, let me take a little sip of this cup here. And we will take a look at these, uh, this particular chapter of Leviticus. It begins with an if-then statement. In fact, chapter 26 of Leviticus is a microcosm, a smaller part of a bigger uh, presentation in Deuteronomy chapter 27 and 28. So this will be a little bit shorter form than Deuteronomy's presentation, but it is a conditional covenant. It is a conditional state. 
Let me read it in Leviticus chapter 26, verses 3 through 13. It says, If you live by my regulations, by my laws, observe my mitzvot, observe my commands, and obey them, then I will provide the rain you need in its season, the land will yield its produce, and the trees in the field will yield their fruit. Your threshing time will extend until the grape harvest, and your grape harvest will extend until the time of sowing seed. You will eat as much food as you want and live securely in your land. I will give shalom in the land. You will lie down to sleep unafraid of anyone. You will rid the land of wild animals. The sword will not go through your land. You will pursue your enemies, and they will fall by the sword. Five of you will chase a hundred, and a hundred of you will chase ten thousand. Your enemies will fall before your sword. I will turn toward you, make you produce, productive, increase your numbers, and uphold my covenant with you. You will eat all you want from last year's harvest, and throw out what remains of the old to make room for the new. I will put my tabernacle among you, and I will not reject you. But I will walk among you to, and be your God, and you will be my people. I will walk among you. I am Adonai, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, so that you would not be their slaves. I have broken the bars of your yoke, so that you can walk upright. Okay. So, uh, chapter 26 of Vayikra, Leviticus, is, like I said, a smaller... A version of Deuteronomy chapter 27 verse 16 through chapter 20 chapter 28 first word that we read in this particular portion in Leviticus 26 verse 3 is im im means if the if part is quick and to the point it says im bekukotai teleku ve'et mitzvotai tishmeru ve'asitem oto if, literally, literally translated, if you walk in my laws and guard, or keep, once upon a time the English word keep meant to guard, if you walk in my laws and guard my commands and do them, well, in short, this means if you walk in my covenant and do it, then he will do all those blessings. And the blessing part, of course, blessing comes from obedience. God has never blessed sin. It would be kind of silly, then he wouldn't have a covenant. The then part of the conditional promise is longer. It says, venati, venatati, pardon me. Venatati means, then I will give. And that's the way of the Lord himself. He is eternally a giving God. Everything that we have is a gift from Him. So, it talks about rain. Whereas the Nile River competes with the Amazon for the status of biggest river in the world, Eretz Israel is not so blessed with water resources and never has been. Uh, any farmer in Israel has had to rely on the God of Israel to supply rain in its seasons. The, the word for yielding fruit can also mean to be flooded with fruit. In essence, the promise is for more than enough, more than enough. He will give shalom, in fact, inner peace and wholeness. In fact, we will lie down to sleep without dread or anxiety, trembling, terror. I'm trying to translate that word there. It can be translated as dread, anxiety, trembling, terror. He says, Vihishbati, Shabbati, Vihishbati Hayara. Literally translated again, and I will cause to cease, I will cause to stop evil beast. There won't be any evil beast in your midst. And that, kind of, that actually gives us the word Shabbat. I will cause evil to cease. I will cause it to, your land will have Shabbat. In verse 9, he says, quote, I will turn my face, I will turn my presence toward you and cause you to be fruitful in the place of his covenant. 
He will give us His Mishkan, His tabernacle in our midst, and not reject us. In fact, His tabernacle, that is His presence among us, means that He will walk among us. He will walk among us. This is, this is like a, a husband taking his wife by her hand and walking with her. Well, after this we read of the other shoe dropping. This is, again, this is a conditional promise. And we will read here Leviticus chapter 26, verse 14 through 17 for starters. But if you will not listen to me and obey all of these mitzvot, all these commands, if you loathe my regulations, if you loathe my laws and reject my rulings in order not to obey all my commands, but cancel my covenant, then I, for my part, will do this to you. I will bring terror upon you, wasting disease and chronic fever to dim your sight and sap your strength. You will sow your seed for nothing because your enemies will eat the crops. I will set my face against you. Your enemies will defeat you. Those who hate you will hound you and you will flee when no one is pursuing you. Okay. The flip side of this coin is also a conditional promise. If we prefer to loathe his covenant as opposed to walking in it or walking in him, that is, if we hit the delete button of his covenant, you know, <laughs> that which we have done for the last 1600 years, if we hit the delete button to his covenant, then he will turn his face away from us. Everything of pleasant promise becomes promises of rejection, right down to the sword pursuing us. And that's also in verse 25. So, let's read further, Leviticus 26, 18 through 20. It doth say, if I turn the page, If these things don't make you listen to me, then I will discipline you seven times over for your sins. I will break the pride you have in your own power. I will make you your sky like iron, your soil like bronze. You will spend your strength in vain, because the land will not produce its fruit, or the trees in the field their fruit so and again when in communion with the Lord when we are in communion with Adonai he promises that 100 will chase 10 that is 100 will chase 10 times that amount of people <coughs> if we loathe that communion we loathe that communion he will discipline us seven times over it's kind of interesting to me that the the Bible promises and blessing that we will be able to conquer ten times the amount, ten times that which is against us. But when we are out of communion with Him, then He will discipline us seven times over. In other words, His discipline is not nearly as harsh as his, the amount of His blessing toward us. He blesses us until we we cannot hold any more blessing and we're running over with it he disciplines us to meet exactly where we are seven times over is abundantly the fullness seven is the hebrew word for fullness and so he will meet us fully right where we are in terms of uh, his rejection, rejection of our lifestyle, or that is his punishment, his spanking, if you will. America has lots of natu me, natural resources. I was talking a little bit ago about the Nile River in competition with the Amazon River for the biggest rivers in the world. And Israel doesn't have, well, just a little Jordan River and some tributaries. America has lots of natural resources, tons of natural resources, but the Lord is quite able to even break our pride here as well. Uh, consider, for instance, the last eight years or so. <coughs> Leviticus chapter 26, verses 21 through 26. It doth say, Yes, if you go against me and don't listen to me, 
I will increase your calamity sevenfold according to your sins. I will send wild animals among you. They will rob you of your children, destroy your livestock, and reduce your numbers until your roads are deserted. If, in spite of all this, if, in spite of all this, you refuse my correction and still go against me, then I, too, will go against you. And yes, I, I will strike you seven times over for your sins. I will bring a sword against you, which I, which will execute the vengeance of my covenant. You will be huddled inside your cities. I will send sickness among you, and you will be handed over to the power of the enemy. I will cut off your supply of bread so that ten women will bake your bread in one oven and dole out your bread by weight, and you will eat but not be satisfied. Okay, so again, I'm just this... All this does is go down a slippery slope. The Lord uses the measure of sevenfold, and this is, quote, according to our sins. That is, again, our sins have specific wages peculiar to each one, each time. Each one and each time. Sickness and scarcity is here described. And then it goes on further down the slippery slope. Leviticus 26 Verses 27 through 38 <clears throat> says, After, oh, pardon me, and if for all of this you still will not listen to me, but go against me, then I will go against you furiously, and I will, I will also chastise you yet seven times more for your sins. You will eat the flesh of your own sons. You will eat the flesh of your own daughters. I will destroy your high places. Cut down your pillars for sun worship and throw your carcasses on the carcasses of your idols. I will detest you. I will lay waste to your cities and make your sanctuaries desolate so as not to smell your fragrant aromas. I will desolate the land so that your enemies living in it will be astounded by it. You, I will disperse among the nations, and I will draw out the sword in pursuit after you. Your land will be a, desola a desolation and your cities a wasteland. Then at last the land will be paid its Shabbats. As long as it lies desolate and you are in the hands of your enemies, the land will rest and be repaid its Shabbats. Yes, as long as it lies desolate, it will have rest, the rest it did not have during your Shabbats when you live there. As for those of you who are left, I will fill their hearts with anxiety in the lands of their enemies. The sound of a, <coughs> pardon me, the sound of a driven leaf will frighten them, so that they will flee as one flees from the sword and fall when no one is pursuing. Yes. With no one pursuing, they will stumble over each other as if fleeing the sword. They will have no power to stand before their enemies, and among the nations you will perish. The land of your enemies will devour you. Okay, well, it gets worse. It gets worse. The Lord uses the word sevenfold, and this is according to our sins. And then he says, just listen. Listen. What I've read to you is about listening. That's all really is what he's, that's what's being repeated over and over again in this particular uh, chapter. In the text, in the Hebrew text, it says over and over again, if you would only listen. If after all of the above happens over time, with us still being obstinate, he will turn on his theory button. This particular section that I just read describes the miry clay that we have fallen headlong into over the last several centuries. Because we killed our children in high places and standing stones for sun worship, he brought siege works against cities that caused such hunger, as we have been thrown into the savage nations. The word nations there, goyim, means Gentiles, the heathen, the nations. Those are the three ways it's translated in every single Bible. As we have been thrown into the savage goyim, the sword has been released against us just because we're us. 
As long as we have been gone, the land has had a chance of, at Shabbat. In the meantime, he has sent weakness rather than strength into our hearts, to the point that we flee from a foe that we only suspect, but who doesn't really exist. In this way, we stumbled over ourselves in fear as the Goyim watched and left. Let's look at Leviticus 26, 39 through 45. And this will take us nearly to the end of the chapter. Those of you who remain will pine away in the lands of your enemies, from guilt over your misdeeds and those of your ancestors. Then they will confess their misdeeds and those of their ancestors which they committed against me in their rebellion. They will admit that they were against me. At that time I will be going against them, <clears throat> bringing them into the lands of their enemies. But if but if their uncircumcised hearts will grow humble, if they are paid the punishment for their misdeeds, then I will remember my covenant with Yaakov, also my covenant with Yitzhak, and my covenant with Avraham, and I will remember the land. For the land will lie abandoned without them, and it will be paid at Shabbats while it lies desolate without them. And they will be paid the punishment for their misdeeds because they rejected my rulings and loathed my regulations. They rejected my mishpatim, that particular division of Torah, and they loathed my chukim, my the laws, that division of Torah. Yet in spite of all that, the second time that phrase is put, yet in spite of all, actually the third time, in spite of all that, I will not reject them when they are in the hands of their enemies, nor will I loathe them to the point of utterly destroying them and thus break my covenant with them, because I am Adonai their God. Rather, for their sakes, I will remember the covenant of their ancestors, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt, with the nations watching, so that I might be their God. I am Adonai. The Lord never breaks his covenant. He has always had a covenant, therefore. And Israel never actually signed the covenant. They agreed to it, but they never signed it. That's why when he offered divorce papers, no one was to be found. Because there was no covenant agreement. Well, not entirely. So, even as we have pined away in the lands of our bitter enemies, the lands of the Goyim, if and when we confess our sins and rebellion against the Lord himself, when we admit that we have gone against him specifically, then he will remember ye old covenant. He will remember. That means make it a member again. Re, you know, I guess you know what the English word re remember means. It used to be a re dash member. He will remember the covenant, even as he once remembered and refreshed the covenant. That's what we call the new covenant. It's literally the refreshed or renewed covenant. Even as he did that, he will do it again. He will cause us to know that his covenant still stands, even as he causes us to stand strong. Now, I don't know why I have so loved these words for so many decades, but yet in spite of all that, Yet in spite of all that, he will turn it all around once more. Maybe that's why I love those words, because in the repetition of curses, he promises he cannot forsake his covenant. Regardless of what we do to his covenant, he himself is loyal. He himself is, he keeps his covenant. He cannot go against himself and thus destroy himself. So yet in spite of all that, he will turn it all back around. In fact, this is his current business right now. All as we begin to pay close attention to him once more with the nations watching. Oh, the nations, in fact, don't really like it. The nations laughed when we were scattered all over the world. The nations are enraged now and united, even in... Geneva in New York City. Leviticus chapter 26, verse 46. It says, These are my laws, rulings, and teachings, 
that Adonai himself gave to the people of Israel on Mount Sinai through Moshe. This has been a public broadcast of, quote, the laws, rulings, and teachings. The word teachings there is Torot. It's the plural form of Torah. This has been a public broadcast from our God. This public broadcast has been a presentation of, on one hand, life and good, and on the other hand, death and evil, the blessing and the curse. He gives us, therefore, a choice. Moshe here presents it, and he will present it again at the end of Deuteronomy, when he says, I have set before you, okay, I have laid it all out before you, I've led, I've showed you good, I've showed you evil, I've showed you blessing, a curse, death, and life. He gives us a choice, and he would sincerely love us to choose life, capital L, life, Hayy. Why would we want to die as if loathing life? Well, let's look at the Haftarah. There is a Haftarah reading for Bihu Kotai, and uh, that is Jeremiah, Yermiyahu, chapter 16, verse 19, 17, verse 14. I guess I'll turn there and read it. 16, Jeremiah, chapter 16. I'm listening in a vehicle of some kind, or on a computer or whatever. I'll just read this for you. Leviticus 16, verse 19 begins something like this. Adonai, my strength, my fortress, my refuge in time of trouble. The nations will come to you from the ends of the earth, saying, Okay, all those people who did laugh at us. They will come to you from the ends of the earth, saying, Our ancestors inherited nothing but lies, futile idols, complete useless. Completely useless. Can a person make himself gods? In fact, they aren't gods at all. Therefore I will make them know, once and for all, I will make them know my power and my might. Then they will know that my name is yod heh that my name is Adonai. Yehuda's sin is written with an iron pen. Okay, the nations don't have to sin with an iron pen. The nations are finally recognizing that, goodness, we've been, you know, chasing the wind and uselessness for so long. But Yehuda's sins, Judah's sins are written with an iron pen, with a... A diamond point, it is engraved on the tablet of their hearts and on the horns of their get altars. As they remember their children, they so they remember their altars and, and their sacred poles by green trees. My mountain in the field, your wealth, and all of your treasures will be plundered. Because of the sin of your high places throughout your territory, you will, be, you will relinquish your hold on your heritage which I gave you. I will make you serve your enemies in a land you do not know. For you have kindled my fiery anger, and it will burn forever. Here's what Adonai says. A curse on the person who trusts in humans, who relies on merely human strength, whose heart turns away from Adonai. He will be like a tamarisk. In the Arava, when relief comes, it is unaffected, for it lives in the sun-baked desert in, in salty, uninhabited land. Blessed is the man who trusts in Adonai. Adonai will be his security. He will be like a tree planted near water. It, it spreads out its roots by the river. It does not notice when he comes, and its foliage is uh, luxuriant. It is not anxious in the year of drought, but keeps on yielding fruit. The heart is more deceitful than anything else, and morally sick. Who can fathom it? I, Adonai, search the heart. I test inner motivations in order to give to anyone with what, what his actions and conduct deserve. And by the way, that lines up perfectly with Hebrews chapter 4, beginning at verse, uh, about verse 12 or so. Just on top of my head. The partridge hatches eggs that do not lay like this. Uh, like this are those who get rich unjustly. In the prime of their life, their wealth will desert them. In the end, they will prove to be fools. The throne of glory exalted from the beginning, our holy sanctuary, hope of the Israel, all who abandon you will be ashamed. Those who leave you will be inscribed in the dust because. They have abandoned Adonai, the source of living water. Heal me, Adonai, and I will be healed. Save me, and I will be saved for you. 
you. No, there was a, a man, and a good Jewish man, who stooped down in the dust one time and wrote a bunch of names. You read it again. All who abandon you will be ashamed. Those who leave you will be inscribed in the dust because they abandon Adonai, the source of living water. Chapter 7. I'm thinking currently of chapter 8 of John. What happened in chapter 7 there at the last of it? He offered living water. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about this particular uh, Haftarah reading. I want to ask a question. Is there a healthy tension between legalism and anarchy? Hebrew, modern or otherwise, has never had a word for legalism or legalistic. This is likely because such a word is rather subjective, depending on a number of things, including place and era. With Orthodox or Rabbinic Judaism, the most stringent and staunch groups are called the Haladim. The, the verb Halad means to tremble, or even to be anxious. I read it to you with the blessings and curses there. The blessing being that you would not tremble, you would lie down and rest, you would not be in, in anxiety and so forth. The curses is that you would tremble, you would be in anxiety. That gives us the word for the most stringent group within Orthodox Judaism called the Haredim. These came into play in a period known as the Haskalah, or the Jewish Enlightenment. Now, Sakal does not mean enlightenment, but that would be perhaps another study, a word study, in fact. But nonetheless, the Jewish Enlightenment period was the mid 1700s to about 1800. Redeem were against modernizing and the traditions that were, that were are far less biblical as the traditions are simply of the time period. And uh, these are actually rather similar to the, um, to, uh, oh goodness, I can't think of the group in, the, in America. But anyway, uh, it's on the tip of my brain. But anyway, um, these. These particular traditions that uh, they were against uh, coming into a modernizing era were stuff like uh, the, the Rekel, the Rekel or the full length suit jacket. A versus a I pronounce it correctly, this is Yiddish. The Trema or the fur hat. And or on Shabbat, the the Mekhishe, the Mekhishe, or Silk Kafta. I speak here really only of dress codes, but the stringency is seen as these are thought to be as important as anything biblical, the Bible never mentioned. Within the Haredim, there are many subgroups. This brings me to the question posed. In this portion, we have seen the word Makarim. Found Harad, as in you will lie down to sleep without dread, anxiety, trembling, terror. In this context, trembling is bad. In Yeshayahu, Isaiah 66, verse 2 and verse 5, trembling at God's word is most certainly good. The same word, the same word Harad. In fact, it is Isaiah 66 that the Haradim take their biblical cue so as to as words go and in context, but the context does matter. Our author speaks of trusting the Lord, trusting Adonai, Jeremiah 16, 19 through 21, and uh, chapter 17, 5 through 8, and 12 through 14. In all those particular texts, basically the whole of the Haftarah. Any time we put our reliance, our trust, into anything other than the Lord Himself, the Lord Himself, that is when we receive a curse, according to Jeremiah 17, verse 5. When we put that trust in the Lord, we receive life, capital L, life. He is, in fact, our life. He Himself, not an attribute of Him, He Himself is our life. Being ultra-conservative to the point of placing your trust in Christian conservatism, quote-unquote Christian conservatism, is legalism. 
Being ultra-liberal to the point of placing your trust in Christian liberalism is legalism. In fact, placing your trust in anything other than the Lord himself, of course, with the title Christian attached to it, is legalism. So we, we will attach the word Christian to many different forms of legalism. What is legalism? Well, it's anytime you're not tr you're trusting anything other than the Lord. Okay? Now, I'm not saying don't be conservative. I'm not saying don't be liberal. I'm saying don't make that your trust. Be as conservative as you possibly can be. Be as liberal and look up the word liberal. Be for liberty as much as you can be, but put your trust in the Lord. Trembling at God's word is equal to bowing in awe of the Lord himself. This, coupled with a poor and contrite spirit, is what the Lord looks on with favor, according to Isaiah 66. Righteousness is grounded in trusting the Lord. We are all happy if we have something of a guide for how to work out a Torah passage in our time and territory. But if that way of works of Torah, i.e. halakha, becomes set as hard as biblical Torah, that way of working things out becomes itself legalism. Therefore, Dr. David Stern, the translation I've been reading from, has rendered the word, the, the Greek phrase ergos namas, as legalism. Namas means works of Torah, that is halakha. Halakha is not the Torah. Halakha is how you work the Torah out. It's a set of guidelines, like keep the Sabbath. How do I keep the Sabbath? Do not plow on the Sabbath. How do I not plow on the Sabbath? Do I not just run my hands through the sand? What does that mean? How do I work it out? Those are good. Those are nice guidelines to have. We all have them. We call it church ordinances. But as soon as we put our trust there, Instead of God himself, that's when Ergos Namas becomes legalism. Further, and in summary, over the many centuries, even with this A.D. era, we may see a bill of charges against us. This bill of charges is because we have lived against the Hukot, the laws of the Bible. Let me read Colossians chapter 2. Verse 14 through 17. Let me turn there. It'll take me a little bit of time because you know the New Testament books are small and I'll, I don't want that. So, okay. Here we are. Colossians 2, verses 14 through 17. Again, I'm reading in uh, Dr. David Stern's translation. It reads like this He, Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah, he walked, he wiped away the bill of charges against us. Because of the regulation, because of the report, because of the laws, because of that particular division of Torah, because of the regulations that stood as a testimony against us, but he removed it by nailing it to the execution stake, stripping the rulers and authorities of their power and made public spectacle of them. Okay, they left with us, we left with them. Stripping, stripping the rulers and authorities of their power, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by means of the cross. So don't let anyone pass judgment on you. Okay, Christians, don't let anyone pass judgment on you in connection with eating and drinking. It's called kashrut. Or in regard to a Jewish festival. That's called the actual God's Festivals in Leviticus 23. Or Rosh Hodesh, that's the new moon, or Shabbat, the weekly Shabbat. These are shadows of things that are coming, but the body is of the Messiah. The body of those things is of the Messiah. The Messiah is the one who, who invented those things, okay? If you believe that the Messiah, if you believe that the Christ, when he says nine times that he is the I Am, then that means you, you're going to believe that the, the Torah came by him. It is his Torah. So, I read that to you, let's talk about it. Because of the Hukot, because of that division of the Torah, not all of Torah, but because of the laws, the laws most commonly carry a death, death sentence. They carry charges that if we don't do them, the Lord will be against us. Because of that, the regulations, the laws, the bill, 
of that stood as a testimony against us. But Yeshua, Jesus the Messiah, removed it by nailing it to the execution stick, to the cross. Stripping the rulers and authorities of their power, he made a public spectacle of them, trying to murder them by means of the stick. So, don't let anyone pass judgment on you in connection with eating or drinking. Okay. Don't let it happen. The context of this is not about the Torah. It's not against the Torah. It's actually saying, don't let anyone pass judgment on you for keeping the Torah. And if you read the Greek words in that passage, and please read the Greek words, not the translation. You know the Lord doesn't want us to trans trust translate. Don't trust any man. Don't trust the whatever current president's in power in America. Don't trust him. Okay? Don't put your trust in the Lord himself alone. Alright? And that also means don't trust your translator. The translator doesn't want you to trust him. The old, the old maxim of translators is the translator is a traitor. Quote, unquote, the translator is a traitor. So, don't let anyone pass judgment on you, Christians, in connection with kashrut, or eating and drinking, or in regard to a festival, or Rosh Hodesh, or Shabbat. These are shadows of things to come, that are coming, but the body of these things is of the Messiah, they're from the Messiah. We are in a shadow land ourselves, and that's not a bad thing. We are the shadow, in a shadow land, as His light shines on us. Shadow is created by light. If there was no light, there could be no shadow. It's not impossible for a shadow to exist without light. He shines, and when that, when his light hits us, it creates a shadow. When his light hits the festivals, it creates a shadow. And a shadow can be a good thing. Transform your mind. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We trust in him, and let that light so shine. For the light are good works of the Torah, according to Proverbs 6.23 and Matthew 5.16. We can do this. We can actually live by the book that we carry around called the Bible, by the whole thing. We say we believe it cover to cover. We can actually live by what we say we believe without being legalistic. It can be done even in our day. Notice how legalistic we are. In our day. Not our day. It's God's day. Trust in Him. Okay? Well, my friends, I thought I'd make a quick presentation, a little bit quicker than I've been, on Leviticus chapter 26. Tomorrow we'll look at the last chapter of Leviticus, and I'd like to try to sum up the book a little bit, too. It's a good book, so misunderstood, because, well, so not read. Shalom, y'all.